Thank you very much and good afternoon. It's certainly easier looking this way than that way. It's a little bit more daunting looking this way. Um, I, I really want to tell you how about I became to be a doctor, I suppose, and what that means to me, and because that really explains to me how I got involved in helping other people, and perhaps in a humanitarian way. And of course, I'm a tiny person of a huge team, and I hope you're all in my team today. I started off as a dentist, actually, and I, I, although I enjoyed that, I really very quickly realized that I wasn't really keen to spend the rest of my life filling people's teeth and looking directly into their mouths. Um, and actually, after that, I went on to train to be a doctor, and I, I, I enjoyed that enormously. I liked all aspects of it. And I, you know, medicine is, is one of those things, actually, when you do it, you sort of realize, are you really doing a hard job? Because it's very enjoyable, and it's very, very sociable. And whether you have little effects or great effects on the people you, you look after, those little, leave little sort of imprints on your soul, every contact that you have with people. And I changed my talk a little bit because we're, I'm going to talk about some of the cases and some of the projects that have been involved. And I start off by saving lives, but really it's changing lives. And it's not only changing the life of the, the child or the individual, it's sometimes changing the life of that family and the whole population. And I, I hope I can illustrate a little bit of that. Now, I, my training really, I'm a plastic surgeon. I, I'm just waiting for the moans and the cabbages to hit me on the stage here. But, um, plastic surgery, the, the term plastic comes from the Greek plastikos, which to, means to move or to change. It has absolutely nothing to do with uh, sort of a gel-filled product. I won't say any more about that, but it has nothing to do with that really at all. And actually, you know, in terms of medical history, it's absolutely fascinating because a lot of the initial plastic surgeons concentrated very much on facial appearance. Not so much facial aesthetics, but facial appearance. And if you go through history from Indian history, and the Shushruta was a a famous, um, well, he did all sorts of things, actually. He was an amazing man, but one of the things he was was a surgeon. But throughout history, people have always liked to chop each other's nose off, whether it's for infidelity, for whatever reasons it is. And actually, the Sushruta developed a very simple thing. This is, you know, hundreds, hundreds of years ago, whereby we used to reconstruct the nose using bits of the forehead. Not to be outdone, several hundred years later, the Italians developed something which looks like you might find it in Prada or on Sloan Street or something, but a very complex device for holding your arm in place because they developed a similar technique, but using skin from your nose. And this isn't 20 or 21st century medicine. This is many hundreds of years ago. However, lots and lots of sort of times passed, of course, since then, and most of the big advances, particularly in surgery and facial surgery, have occurred around times of great trauma, and the wars, of course, very focus ourselves very much on that. Harold Gillis was a New Zealander who um, worked very uh, hard with the surgeons of the First World War, uh, and actually an artist who used to describe and draw these, pa these, these, these uh, patients to try and transform their lives, and he realized the ability and the need to bring those people together. His cousin Archibald McIndoe formed a club called the Gu Guinea Pig Club, which many of you might have heard of, where ex-servicemen came together that did lots of drinking and smoking, but they had lots of operations to try and actually make them uh, back it or give them back the lives that they deserved, really. However, we come right up to the sort of mid towards the end of the 20th century, Paul Tessier, who's a French surgeon, really coined the term or the, uh, the specialty of craniofacial surgery. And this involves not only accessing the face to, to bring about change or to rebuild the face, but often the face and the brain, as one might imagine, are intimately connected, and craniofacial involves bringing both of those disciplines together, so neurosurgery and plastic surgery. But that's there's a whole range of other people also involved. To build up now to, to where I've come from is to where what my involvement with the, the charity facing the world is. This, this picture shows two people who will be enormously influential in my life and my career. On the left is Norman Waterhouse, who's a craniofacial surgeon working at the Chelsea and Westminster. And on the right is Martin Kelly, who was my friend, but also a surgeon there who very tragically died um, almost four years ago this May, in actual fact. And Martin was one of those slightly annoying in a way, but truly inspirational people, because whatever he did, he was very good and passionate about. And I hope that whatever we're doing today with our charity, it really reflects that. He, he set up this charity because he realized that there were children around the world, and he found this out in his own education and their families that could not access often the basic medical care, but actually treatment that could help them to lead the lives that they should have. 
And I'm going to illustrate this with some of the cases and some of the things he found originally. This, is a, this little girl, back almost 10 years ago now, was one of the first children I helped to look after. And it's a terribly sad story in a very provincial part of Afghanistan. This little girl lived with her father. The mother actually wasn't around. But the other people in the village had approached religious leaders to say, this child is a bad omen. You know, we should stone her to death. You know, there was that sort of degree of, of trepidation and fear about looking at this family. And actually, when Martin was working over there doing some training, this family just found their way to him. And that's one of the other amazing things. These patients and their families just find you. They come from all different sources. And with the internet of now, of course, it's incredibly more easy to do that. And, you know, they came for some initial surgery. And with a lot of these surgeries for these sort of children, the thing about children, of course, is they grow. So surgery might carry out when they're two or three may not be appropriate or may not be long-lasting. You may need to do more as time goes on. And these people actually, this story, you know, me telling you about it, doesn't really begin to tell you the hardships they went to find us again. And we brought them back to the UK. Once her face had grown, she hasn't got a normal face, but I think you'd agree that having not a cleft in your face, having a nose and, and eyes, gives everybody a sense of, of recognition. You know, you're in my gang. I recognize who you are. And this has allowed her to go back home and hopefully to, to grow and have the life that she should have. Now, this patient, of all the patients I talk about, is the most poignant for me because Martin and I were looking after this little boy when he died. And this, this boy, Mohammed, from northern Ethiopia, had leishmaniasis, which is an infective disease, which literally eats away at the tissue of your face. And here, he had eaten away at his nose and his face. And this child was also abandoned. He was almost abandoned by his own family because, you know, they, 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 they endured such hardship because of him. And little by little, through various different agencies and circuitous tracks, he found his way to us. And this is actually towards the end of his journey, but this boy has the most amazing eyes. He looks at you. He looks into your soul. He speaks to you. And actually, we reconstructed his nose, and, and he's gone back home, and actually, we get little, little letters from him via other circuitous routes to say that he's thriving and he wants to become a doctor. I mean, you know, he, he's gone the whole journey. These things aren't cheap to do. The cost of bringing children over here, medical care in this country is enormously expensive. And of course, we don't charge at all, but it's all the hospital costs and those involved. The most difficult thing of all, the easiest thing of all, is sometimes doing the surgery. It may be incredibly complex, but it's often easy to do because of the... Uh, because everything is sorted out. The most difficult thing is who should we choose? We rely heavily on sponsorship, and I'm going to name and shame a few sponsors because they've been so helpful to us. The Al Fayed Foundation, a group of children, uh, uh, two adults here, Bertie Portal and James Cash, who rode the Atlantic. It took some 69 days to row from La Gomera to Barbados because, as Bertie said, he had a fear of water, but the, the bravery needed to endure surgery and put yourself forward was nothing. Uh, to what it was going to be uh, for him, and other organizations too. I wanted to focus on a few of our children in particular, however, just as I come towards the end of this. And the first of these is a little girl called Landina. Landina was involved in an earthquake in Haiti a couple of years ago in which a third of a million people died. In fact, she was already in a hospital because she had very poor social circumstances. And when the hospital collapsed, her mother never went to the hospital, fearing that she was already dead. She was found there by Médecins Sans Frontières, one of my friends and colleagues, David Knott, and we brought her back to the UK. She'd lost most of the skull and bone in her, of her scalp, uh, and actually she needed some very complex uh, surgery to, to sort those problems out. We reunited her with her mother, but actually perhaps in an even greater act of humanity, her mother said, you know, her life will never be the same in Haiti, and now she's going through the process of being adopted over here. Where, where we sort of slightly altered and where, I guess, we used to bring a lot of children over here, we set up a program in Vietnam, in Da Nang, which is right in the center. And Vietnam is one of the most beautiful countries in the world with one of the most inspirational sets of people. And this is different because rather than bringing children over here consistently, we, teach, we, we go over there and we teach the doctors and we're establishing a plastic surgery craniofacial unit over there as well. Last year, we, we, we presented them with the Martin Kelly Library because as our, one of our founders, we thought it was important that they realized the history of our charity. 
Often you'll, you'll arrange to see 10 patients, you'll open the door, there'll be 100 patients. It's a very rewarding experience. There's often so many doctors there that here's me in the middle of this. I was almost pushed out of the way because they're so keen to see and to learn. We take a team, and this is a little microcosm of our team because the team is far more expensive than this, but it's a great opportunity to work together. It's a great opportunity to educate other people. And the little Hui is with us at the moment, and in a few weeks' time, I'll be operating him to make him better. I put this picture of this girl here, and I know people have said to me, this picture actually is uncomfortable to look at. But what I'd say to you is, how uncomfortable do you think she feels walking along the street when people are looking at her? And we, she was a girl we had to bring to England. We had to remove her eye and do some complex reconstructive surgery. But actually, it's made a tremendous difference to her life. Uh, and we set up a, uh, an agency to make artificial eyes there to support some of these things as well. These boys had neurofibromatosis, which is a very common condition, actually, in Vietnam, possibly due to the effects of dioxin poisoning. And some very simple surgery makes them look very different. This is a little boy who I looked after last year, I'm very sad to say, died. And the, what the, sort of the terrible thing about looking after some of these complex children is that always things don't go well, and that's very hard. Viet is a little boy who, at this moment, has a complex cleft and is having surgery in West London. I'm going to concentrate for a few seconds, because I know that John's going to be approaching me on the stage, to talk about two Sudanese twins that you may have seen in the press towards the end of last year. These little girls, born to two doctors in Sudan, had a condition called craniopagus, where the, the skulls are joined together, and sometimes the brains are fused. We sponsored these children to come to Great Ormond Street, and under the uh, great surgical techniques and, and the great support of them, and David Dunaway, the craniofacial surgeon there in particular, we endeavored to separate them, and very luckily been able to do so. This took lots of planning and several operations, over 40 hours of surgery, but I think you can see that the result of two completely normal little girls uh, is the most amazing thing to do. I'm just going to leave you with that little picture of Hui because I saw him on Thursday and we're planning his surgery. And every time he says, operation, operation, and I say, a few more days, operation. And it's a bit like your children when they're saying, how many sleeps till Christmas? Because he knows that this surgery will give him his life. Thank you very much.